Welcome back. Glad you've joined me. If you have your Bibles, turn to Matthew chapter 9. Matthew chapter 9. We're going to start at verse 35 this morning. You know, unemployment for Murray County here in Oklahoma is currently about 3.9%. It's a little higher than the average for the state of Oklahoma, which is at 3.4%, and well below the national average at 4.3%. And that's just one statistic, really not all that helpful when it comes to discovering why there's a shortage of workers, uh, which is what seems like is going on. Discovering why that shortage exists is a little bit more complicated. Basically, I read that nearly 50, nearly half of all the people over 55 left the workforce sometime around the pandemic time and and just kind of dropped out of the employment pool altogether for a variety of reasons. And the working mom population is at the lowest it's been since the 70s. Right at 50% of working women have left the workforce. You couple that with inflation and wage rates, and we find that there's actually people who would work but can't earn enough to risk taking a job that can't sustain them or pay the bills that would be incurred by having to go to work. And and so it's it's a sequential vortex, as a friend of mine would, would say, and it leaves employers without employees at every level. Add to that the people in the job market that simply don't want to work consistently and show up a day here or a day there and just not stay with it. And then there are the jobs out there that you know people just don't want to do. For the record, I'm fortunate enough to be healthy enough to work. I get too hungry not to work, by the way. As, as a small business owner, it gets more expensive, though, every day that I work. I'm, I'm also fortunate at, enough to have a collection of people willing to work in my business field that are just as hungry as I am. And so even still, there's more work than can be done by those doing the work. And as our population growth continues to decline, this just only gets worse. So here, I've delivered the employment bad news for the day, but I, I want us to hear some truth. Truth is, there has always been and will always be more work than there are workers willing to do it. My favorite excuse is, but, but you don't understand. I, I have a master's degree in such and such, and, and I can't do that job because I'm overqualified. And, and in the most compassionate way possible, I usually respond with you know something extremely philosophical like, suck it up, buttercup, go to work, you know. Obviously, some locations fare better than others, but still, the situation persists. We even find it in the Bible. And that's where we're going to read about this morning in Matthew chapter 9, beginning at verse 35. So if you will, just follow along with me. Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into this harvest field. Let's pray together. Father, I thank you for the time we get to spend in your word today. I pray that you would indeed send workers into the harvest field that you would guide people to a relationship that, that works out through serving your son, Jesus. For it's in his name we pray. Amen. You know, I struggle with this a little bit just because I ask my time, myself all the time, who wouldn't want to work for Jesus? I mean, who wouldn't want to be involved in sharing the gospel, the good news to people? And, and I guess there's, there's some reasons that people would come up with, I suppose, that they wouldn't want to do that, but I kind of looked at this passage and, and, and thought about how Jesus taught it. You know, Jesus was basically saying to us that ministry is just as itinerant as it ever was. In verse 35, we read that Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness. Now, I want you to know that this is Matthew repeating himself. He, he said almost identical words back in chapter 4, verse 23. 
when he said Jesus went throughout Galilee teaching in their synagogues, preaching the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness among the people. And so this is not some new thing that Jesus has embarked on here. In every possible sense, Jesus is teaching his disciples how to reach people. And basically what he's saying to them is first you have to go where they are and tell them the truth. Even if it hurts their feelings or challenges their ideas or their ideology for that matter. They all thought the Messiah was going to be a very different person. When Jesus walked into a synagogue, he was met with people that had a preconceived notion about who the Messiah was going to be and what the kingdom that he would bring in was going to be like. They, they all felt like this was going to be an earthly political kingdom. And so they had this all fixed in their minds. They even had fixed in their minds what their relationship with God was supposed to look like. And by the way, it wasn't pretty, nor was it accurate. But we have to remember their source. The people that were teaching them, the religious leaders of the day, were, were oppressing them spiritually as much as the Roman government was oppressing them politically. And, and so the, the model that they were being shown was completely inaccurate. Jesus' plan, though, was very plain and very simple. You start with going where they are. And yes, it was geographical in, in some sense. When we think about Jesus' ministry, we can draw circles on the map and say this is where Jesus did his work. But, but there's also a metaphorical sense in that as well. I mean, think about it this way. People are not just in a place. They were in a place. You know, you got to love the English language at this point, right? I mean, let's, let's face it, there's, that can be a little bit confusing to hear. But so think of it this way. People were in Galilee and people were in a pickle. So it wasn't just about where they were. It was where they were in life as well. And so the people were in Galilee, the people were in a pickle. And so he met people where they were. Same for us. If we're going to be involved in the ministry that God sends us to into the harvest field, we're going to have to go to where people are. We meet them where they are, just like Jesus did. But then the second part of this plan is that we meet their needs. In verse 36, we read, When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Now you might think, because I glossed over the first part of this in verse 35, that or 30, yeah, 35, that, you know, Jesus was healing people, but his healing ministry wasn't the point, wasn't the point, especially the point of meeting their needs. Yes, they were sick, they were infirmed. Many of them were in need of some kind of physically, physical healing. But the miracles that Jesus did weren't, weren't the wasn't the point. The, the Old Testament prophecy spoke of the one that would come, the Messiah, and he would come with signs and wonders. And, and by the way, there was, there was no greater sign known than the healing ministry of Jesus as he went through the towns and the villages healing all of their sick. But remember what verse 35 said. It says they were harassed and helpless, wandering like sheep without a, ser a shepherd. Verse 36 said that for us. And and so we begin to understand what the real point of need was. More than physical healing, their greatest need was someone to follow. Someone that would give them the perfect example of what a relationship with God would look like. With that in mind, it's easy to see that this ministry that Jesus had was driven with passion and compassion, if you will, and and that the driving forces of meeting people's needs wasn't the physical healing, it was the spiritual healing. Perhaps you've heard it said that being a Christian doesn't pay much, but the retirement, retirement plan is out of this world. It's kind of trite and cliche, but you know the truth is that we see needs around us, but the real need, Jesus saw the real need. Jesus showed perfect compassion in spite of overwhelming demand. You know, it's easy to feel for people when they're in need. A fire or some kind of disaster destroys all of their belongings, or they have an accident or illness that takes away their health. And 
All kinds of circumstances take their toll on people in the most inopportune times and at the very deepest of levels. It's easy to feel for people when they're in need. And if you care about people at all, it's impossible to ignore. And the reality is we all want to impact that in some way. I have a client that I rarely bill. <laughs> it's, and, and when I do bill them, it's not very much. And you might understand that I'm not even recovering costs many, much of the time. And, but they do some amazing work with some of the most needy people in Oklahoma City. They operate on a shoestring budget. They depend on volunteers from every walk of life, from the medical field to food service to, to uh, acquisition of supplies. And they depend on the faithfulness of donors, both financial and material. And, and it literally hurts my heart when I have to send them a bill because I know that if they have to pay me money, that's money that's not going into the ministry to the people that, that genuinely need help. But what's more is they are more concerned about the spiritual assistance than they are the physical. Yes, they meet a lot of physical needs. And yes, they help people with all kinds of physical things. But, but the reality is they are more interested in guiding people into a relationship with Jesus than they are about healing their wounds, helping them walk through a spiritual journey. When we look around us, it's easy to see those people in great need. But unfortunately, sometimes we're blinded some to the greater spiritual need. The overwhelming physical ones just take precedence over everything. Jesus did not meet physical needs as an end. He met them as a means. You see, what Jesus was doing with his miracles was authenticating himself as the Messiah, the one sent by God to save the world. They needed to be ready to hear him and see him. And, and, and in, a, in the most powerful of ways, he showed who he was. God's one and only son that came to this earth. And he taught them that they needed a savior. You know, nothing has changed. It's still the greatest need in our world today is the need for a Savior. Unfortunately, like many in Jesus' day, we kind of miss the point. We, we see the need, we see the hurt, we see the pain, and can't look past it to see the, the need, the real need, the one to know Jesus. The one that the song talks about that says, people need the Lord. In 1983, two Christian musicians, Greg Nelson and Phil McHugh, were having lunch in Nashville. And McHugh became aware of the pain in their waitress's eyes and, and said to his friend, people need the Lord. And so Nelson agreed, yes, yes, people need the Lord. Story goes that the rest of the meal, they sketched out the song that would become quite popular. The lyrics go this way. Every day they pass me by, I can see it in their eye. Empty people filled with care, headed who knows where. On they go through private pain, living fear to fear. Laughter hides the silent cries only Jesus hears. People need the Lord. People need the Lord. At the end of broken dreams, he's the open door. People need the Lord. People need the Lord. When will we realize people need the Lord? So I, I challenge you today to have some compassion. Look at the needs, see the needs, understand the needs, but understand the real one, the real need that people need to know Jesus. Look beyond the physical to see the spiritual. And then thirdly, we need to be willing to do the work. In verse 37, we read, Then he said to his disciples, The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. The work needed is outpacing the workers to do it, and it always has. It doesn't matter what the field or what the, what the job, the workers to do the work are fewer than the amount of work to do. Interesting is that this is a statement that Jesus makes. It's not a question. It's not a request. There's, it's just a statement. 
It's an honest assessment made by the Savior of the world as he looked into the harvest field and saw that the workers were few, and he, he just made a simple statement. I can't help but wonder if the disciples heard Jesus say those words and looked out among the crowd and said, boy, you got that right. I mean, look at all those people that need healing and all those sick people and all those hurt people and all of those infirm. There's just so many more to heal than we can possibly get done. And and I wonder if, if like us, they became focused on the physical need and, and missed the greater point. They looked at the things they could fix rather than what Jesus could do in the lives of these people. I wonder if some that were healed physically even missed that point. It's easy to get caught up in the labor and forget the compassion. We see a statement, but I think I also hear a challenge. That's how we treat this verse most of the time as we preach from it. I'm going to be honest with you. We use that passage of scripture to, to try to engage people in the work of the church, but what, what we hear Jesus saying there is there's not enough workers and we use it to encourage people to work. And it's not wrong, by the way. I, I, think it's, I think it's a challenge that we use pretty well. But no one has to tell us that a very small percentage of people who attend church are actively involved in the harvest. There's studies that prove the point. Some are financial. 5% of church goers tithe. 77% of those that tithe give more than 10%. And since I don't look at, nor am I interested in looking at giving records, I don't know if that is a statistic that fits Darty Baptist Church or not. I would guess it does not. Some of the things are numerical. 20% of churchgoers regularly volunteer. Again, I don't think that probably reflects accurately in our congregation here, but some of it is church leadership related. Church leadership tends to only engage about 45% of the churchgoers with opportunities to volunteer. And quite frankly, I may be the very worst at that. We find statistics that say for every 100 members in a Baptist church, five are reached with the gospel. That means it takes 20 Baptists a year to reach one person for Christ. You know what that statistic tells me? It tells me the, the workers are few. I think we can prove it statistically. And so the question is, are we challenged by Jesus' statement? Does it make us think about what we ought to do? And just so you know, Jesus was not, and I am not, passing judgment on inactivity. The truth is, there's only one source and one way to find those willing to do the work of sharing the gospel. There's only one answer to the shortage of manpower. And we read about it in verse 38. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into this harvest field. You know, this, this whole passage that we've read this morning is the beginning of a discourse by Matthew. It carries on through chapter 10. And it's a, it's a really important chapter in Matthew about sharing the gospel and how it was done and lays out for us the example that Jesus set. Jesus' words at the beginning of this are very important extremely important, in fact, that, that we, uh, we hear what he has to say to us, because I want to tell you the honest truth, that we can teach, equip, and send people into the harvest fields and have zero results, because we did it. We need to hear Jesus' words carefully. It's the Lord of the harvest that needs to do the sending. We're to do the praying. Now, the church that prays for the Lord of the harvest to send workers will see the Lord of the harvest send workers. That's just a simple truth. When we pray that God will send workers, God will send workers. It's just how it happens. Jesus said it. I believe it. And so it is absolutely true. The church that prays for the Lord to send them will find the Lord sending them. The workers will be called by God, not by man, to enter the harvest field. And these workers will see... As we'll see in the later verses in chapter 10, they're going to be equipped by God for the harvest. Those workers will find success, not because we sent them, but because God sent them. The Lord of the harvest sent them into the harvest. 
Now, you may be thinking, well, I'm, you know, I don't know how to lead somebody to Jesus. And you may think you're even incapable of such. And I would tell you that, yep, that's correct. You have assessed properly. You cannot do it. And you are not capable. But I want to tell you something. If the Lord of the harvest sends you into the harvest field, I promise you, he will equip you for the task. You may think you're incapable, but God, what God does through you will tell a different story. The harvest that God brings because you yield yourself to his work will tell the real story about the worker in the harvest field. Now, you may think, well, I don't know where to go. I don't know where the harvest field is. And again, I'm going to tell you, it's wherever you go. It's where you work. It's where you play. It's where you visit. It's where you eat. It's where wherever you are is the harvest field. And by the way, I don't want you to be surprised if you decide to accept the challenge that Jesus laid out before us and you begin to pray that God would send workers into the harvest field. If he doesn't call you into the harvest field, Every believer is called to the harvest field. And so we pray to God that he would send them so that we will go. When we respond to the call of God that is brought on by the church praying, the harvest will be plentiful. I don't know if this church grows numerically, but I promise you the kingdom will grow numerically. And so we pray. Not just that the lost will come to faith in Christ, but the Lord of the harvest will send workers into the field. Let's let him be responsible for the results because he'll do it way better. If Christ's church is going to continue, we must be a church that prays to the Lord of the harvest to send workers into the field. You see, Jesus shows us how it works. And now we join together and pray that Jesus will send the workers, us even, into the harvest. Let's pray together. Father, I thank you so much for opportunities to tell people about your son Jesus and your kingdom. And God, I do indeed pray. I pray diligently that you, as the Lord of the harvest, would send workers into the field, wherever that field may be in this church, in the churches around us, in, in the workplaces, in the schools. God, this is that time of year where students gather back together in places where students who are Christian can be the workers that are sent into the harvest. And so we pray that you would send them, equip them, teach them, guide them, give them words to say, show them how to act, how to live, how to how to minister to people in their point of need, whether it be physical or spiritual. But God, I pray that you would send the workers into the harvest. Father, I pray that you would help to soften our hearts, help us to remember that we are the workers and that you have already told us to go. Father, I pray that you would remind us again today that we are sent by you, by your son, Jesus, to impact a world that needs to know him as Savior and Lord. For it's in his name we pray. Amen. Thank you for joining me. It's always a pleasure. I know you're there. So yeah, I, I, can, I can't see you, but I know you're there. Thank you for watching. I appreciate it. If you, if you don't mind, like and share the video. Help people see and hear the need. The help wanted sign, if you will that there are workers being called into the harvest because we're praying that the Lord of the harvest will send them. Would you do that for me? Come visit us here in Darty. We'd love to have you in this place to worship with us. It's, uh, it, it is an environment that is difficult to describe, and so I'd love for you to just come experience it. We meet here at 11 o'clock on Sunday mornings. We have Bible study at 9.30 a.m. on Sunday. Another Bible study at 6 p.m. on Sunday night and a prayer meeting on Wednesday nights at 6 p.m., and Lots of opportunity to be involved in that. We'd love to have you. You come join us, will you? Have a great week. We'll see you next time.